Hello, everyone. Hi. So, is monogamy dead? Well, wow. When I posed this question as the title to my Edinburgh Fringe show a couple of years ago, I had no idea that I was embarking on a monumental emotional journey that would radically reset the parameters of my perception of romantic relationships. Now, it was loosely the follow-up to a show that I had done a couple of years before called The Science of Sex, which was kind of a spoofy history of sex research through the decades, including the work of these two, Masters and Johnson, who, amongst other discoveries, were the first people to tell us that uh, for a woman to have an orgasm, a penis was not necessary. <laughs> a discovery that I think she looks slightly happier about. <laughs> than him in this particular photograph. <laughs> but seriously, when I was touring this show, the thorny issue of monogamy hadn't yet come up as a subject. But then something happened and my relationship broke down, closely followed by all of my friends' relationships. It was bizarre, it was a bit like we were lined up, like dominoes, all sort of toppling into one another. And as if our attachments were flimsy, like houses of cards, compared to the sturdy structures that our parents' generation had built. As if this relationship malaise was a virus, a pandemic, that was spread by watching romantic films. <laughs> because they're completely unrealistic, aren't they? And so a huge gulf opens up between our expectation of love and our experience of it. And as a society, we've evolved to no longer tolerate this chasm of compromise. And so, what do we do when we're here in this quite pleasant humdrum state in a relationship a few years in, when conversation has turned away more to sort of who's going to put the bins out as opposed to shall we play Kinky Cagney and Lacey? <laughs> Just a hypothetical example uh, there. Clearly, I was Cagney. Uh, but, but what do we do when we're here? We start looking around, don't we, and thinking, well, that person over there isn't actually tolerating being a bit bored in their marriage, and so I'm not going to either. I'm going to ditch this person, go and find somebody new and amazing who's going to make me feel brilliant. And then as the dopamine and oxytocin effects wear off as we acclimatise to them, we find ourselves back in, we look around again, we go and find somebody new, and we end up like serial and monogamous yo-yos. And my physics teacher once used a yo-yo in school to demonstrate an unstable system that will eventually break down. Because what was happening here? Because we all need to feel safe, don't we? But we also need to feel excitement and hope. And my friends were all breaking up because we felt we couldn't attain this without periodically discarding the good solid relationships that underpin us. Because our current language and thinking around monogamy is ambiguous, unsophisticated, and no longer fit for purpose. So I decided to investigate. I put an anonymous survey online and asked people what type of relationships they were in. And most people said that they were monogamous, whether single or in a relationship. What do we even mean? We've lost sight of the original Greek meaning, monos gamos, one marriage for life. Now we tend to mean one marriage at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and the downside of serial monogamy is serial breakup that me and my friends were experiencing. So perhaps the antidote could be the way of life a few of my survey respondents had chosen. They were polyamorous, having multiple consensual, loving relationships, all honestly declared, although it is quite tricky to do so on Facebook, you'll find. And I thought this sounded brilliant until I saw that actually two of my polyamorous respondents were actually still single. And I thought, that's a bit depressing, isn't it? You set off to have loads of relationships, you still can't actually find one. <laughs> And many of us might think, well, I couldn't be polyamorous, you know, it would just be too much time management, you know, it would just be too complicated. But don't worry, you can say, if you feel you've reached your romantic threshold, you can say that you're polysaturated. <laughs> but before we all go, oh, no, that's a bit freakish, maybe we need to wake up and smell the coffee, and realise we're all a bit poly, actually. Because I asked my friend, would you ever have an open relationship? She said, no, no. I couldn't do that, but what about love affair friendships? 
And she went on to describe an impenetrable fortress of female friendship, her own group of girly best mates who'd known each other since school. And to me, they sounded far more bonded to and in love with one another than their respective husbands. And I thought, we don't have the language to describe the diversity of connections that we experience. Why is sex the thing we tend to define a relationship by when it can be casual fun? And um, why do we say just friends? When for some a friendship goes deeper, could we devise a new currency of commitment that celebrates and values this and goes beyond the binary of romantic or not and recognises a vast continuum that actually runs in between? Could we actually stop thinking about relationships ending and think about them changing from one type of love to another? Instead of placing this burden on the words love and friendship, could we have lots of words like the Greeks? Could we abandon phrases like breakup and instead opt for conscious uncoupling? <laughs> or, if you do find that one a bit worthy and pretentious, then make up your own phrase. But one that's less about the act of breaking and more about treasuring and valuing and preserving and remoulding slowly over time, like a fine sculpture that we want to keep around us, a thing of beauty. Imagine a world where you don't have to hate your ex. Imagine a world where you don't even have an ex, you have family. So we also had people responding to the survey who were in an open relationship. Now, this is often an arrangement negotiated by gay men who seem able to separate out long-term love and more casual short-term intimacy a little bit more successfully, perhaps, than lesbians like me um, do. And in fact, when they tried to invent a lesbian equivalent to the gay male dating app Grindr, it didn't really catch on initially, perhaps because they gave it the really unsexy name of Brenda. <laughs> And also, because men and women work differently. I joked to my friend, I logged onto it, it said, hello Rosie, your nearest lesbian is in New Zealand. <laughs> but the app developers soon realized you couldn't just use the same algorithms for men and women, and the apps became loads better when they realized this. But same-sex relationships are a really fascinating test case because they give us a peek into what men get up to without women around to muddy the picture, and vice versa. And I know gender's a bit less binary than that now, but there are some patterns that we ought to look at. Because let's take a look at this San Franciscan survey, where a sample of over 6,000 people in the year 1975 were asked about extra-relational sexual behaviour. And a slightly smaller sample asked the same question in the year 2000. And interestingly, we see across all these groups, monogamy actually increasing, perhaps as a result of the AIDS crisis in the 80s, people getting married later, having casual sex beforehand perhaps. Also, we do seem in the media to become so much more judgmental about affairs, don't we? So, you do see, of course, that we still have gay men very much um, having the most extra-relational activity, 59%, and lesbians the least at 8%. And this did tally with my own survey, where lesbians did indeed report the least affairs, but by a million miles, the highest turnover of serious relationships, the greatest number of devastating separations, the highest rate of serial monogamy. And this is demonstrated in the UK civil partnership dissolution rates, which are actually twice as high for female couples as they are for male ones. It's quite surprising, this. They're still some way behind heterosexual divorce rates, but we can't really compare the two yet. Apparently, we are catching up, so yay, equality. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so when I, I look, thought about this, I looked around at my lesbian friends and our totally disrupted lives, and I thought, well, you know, this is, this is rubbish. We're sort of losing everything every few years. Maybe gay men have got it right, and they've found a way to sort of defy this yo-yo system, haven't they, and, and break free from it by simultaneously being in both states. And these stats also 
fit in quite nicely with one of the key findings of this book that came out a couple of years ago, What Do Women Want? by Daniel Bergner, because of course we do need a man to tell us uh, what women want. Uh, even though, even though it's written by a man, this book was actually a real godsend to me because I remembered that it is okay to be a woman who thinks about sex, because we all do, but female sexuality doesn't get discussed, doesn't get talked about, so sometimes it's quite easy to forget about that. But Bergner, what he did, he spoke to a lot of scientists and researchers, many of them women themselves, and found out that it is women who indeed struggle with monogamy and crave novelty much, much more. When I heard this, I thought, well, no wonder the lesbians are struggling. It's us that need the open relationships, not the men. Or has this extreme serial monogamy sort of evolved, if you like, as a more female pattern of behaviour that lesbians have somehow chosen as a way of incorporating this novelty? Would straight women behave more like this if they could? Would straight men behave more like gay men if they could go and have lots of sex? No idea. Um, so, you know, I thought, I thought this was uh, an interesting thing to think about. And if you are going to decide to open up your relationship, of course, you might want to really set up a whole new level of honesty. Because let's take a look at some of the non-sexual secrets that my mostly monogamous survey respondents were keeping. And you can see that my favorite one here, third down, um, <laughs> is 12 people confess to secretly giving themselves the best portion of food. And if you are, if you are still going to actively choose monogamy, which you know, I think it's fine to still choose it, you know, but it's nice if you can actively choose it knowing there were other options available. It was a choice and it wasn't the only option that you could have. Um, you do need to discuss your boundaries. <coughs> My girlfriend and I did this and it turns out I can kiss somebody else if it's a sponsored snog and it's for charity. <laughs> But of course, what you need to agree is the answer to the final question in my survey. In a monogamous relationship, what counts as infidelity? And in my show, we actually revealed these in a game of family fortunes, which was, was very exciting, but you've got them all here. And you can see, perhaps not surprisingly, the top answer was having sex with somebody else. Now, we're being quite broad about the definition there, including oral sex. I think there's no sort of presidential get-outs um, <laughs> here. And some people, interestingly, did then add on a location, uh, having sex in a car, as if... <laughs> as if that sort of makes a little difference. <laughs> and next, we had kissing somebody else. And my favorite line in The Joy of Sex actually comes in the chapter about kissing. And it says, um, a good mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss should leave its recipient breathless, but not asphyxiated. <laughs> So, <laughs> kissing is actually my favourite part of sex, because at that stage there's still hope. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it, that we do... <laughs> it's interesting that we do define it as foreplay, because that means there's a whole burden of pressure on it, that we have to then follow through and have sex, and actually a lot of couples stop kissing precisely because of that, like, oh, I'm going to have to have sex, I don't want to kiss. Um, so, I, I want to reclaim snogging as an activity we can enjoy in its own right. And then it started to perhaps surprise me a little as we really came up with some of the emotional monogamy sort of answers that really strained this terrain of love affair friendships. 73 people thought falling in love with someone else without sexual contact would count as infidelity. Um, then we had text or email flirting, staying up all night talking to somebody else. A lot of audiences were really surprised, and you're nodding, but 31 people chose that. Um, masturbating, 14 people chose that, and that's where I really thought, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> And seven people said fantasizing about somebody else, and I thought, wow, how would you police that? <laughs> and four people looking at porn alone.
I did this um, talk actually at Child Friendly event where someone had changed that um, to looking at naughty pictures sometimes moving. Um, <laughs> and then the audience thought that was sometimes emotionally moving. So, <laughs> oh, got very, very confusing. So anyway, what this shows in quite a silly and light way is there's actually no universal one-size-fits-all monogamy, is there? It's a very personal choice. So do communicate with your partner. Don't make assumptions about what their boundaries are. Don't feel you have to suffer in silence and not talk about your sexuality. Negotiate, make up your own language, like love affair friendships. Use your own phrases and above all, be compassionate. Thank you.